All right. Hey, here with my friend Sean, also a teammate. Try that one more time without adjusting in your chair. All right. I am here with my friend Sean. <laughs> All right. I'm here with my friend and teammate Sean. Uh, we just wanted to talk about kind of where he came from, a little bit of his background, uh, leading up to some of his proper military experience and then some of his uh, Wild West Ukraine experience. So uh, kind of start out uh, the fun, one of the funnier stories. I guess, uh, how old you were when you joined the military properly? And then uh, what led you to joining, basically? So I was 16 when I, uh, when I joined. Um, it was something I'd always wanted to do. Um, so yeah, 16 years and nine months old I was, so yeah. Yeah, and then uh, at that time, uh, clearly it was legal, uh, which in the United, uh, in the United States, not really a thing, but uh, what about your job? What'd you do? Did you get the pick? Um, so, yeah, it was one of those uh, where you turn up to the careers office and you're asked to pick two choices. So you have a first and a second choice. My first choice was the parachute regiment. Um, my second choice was the Royal Anglians. Um, it was just one of those kind of things. Um, I initially weighed i think it was 50 something kilos which is approximately half of what i weigh now um but yeah it, it was it, it was quite a, a big ask so i was actually in um it was a, a failed test program so at the time before before i joined they used to have a thing called junior para um after I joined, they had uh, Army Foundation College, and I was in the in-between stage. So they kind of tested out whether 16-year-olds could kind of go to depot with all the adults. Um, most of us got kind of broken. Um, yeah, it was probably not the best idea, but you know, it was it was tried out for a little while. And then during this testing program, that's when they injected you with the Wolverine stuff and that made you, <laughs> so you can't be killed essentially. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah very nice. All right, and then from there, uh, how long did you spend in para? Uh, deployments from there, kind of experiences there. What, what right. do you think as a 16 year old in the military? So um, I went to depot, um, Past depot, so I think we started off with 50 or 60 guys. Uh, we passed out with 10, um, went to two para, um, and kind of had a military career from, from there onwards. My first operational tour was in Northern Ireland. Um, after that, so after Northern Ireland, I went to Sierra Leone, Macedonia, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, pretty much all of those uh, places while I was in uh, Pararej. But yeah, yeah, it was a, a funny time. What a, uh, I mean, were there other people that young with you for the most part? Or I mean, when you go in there and you're doing these deployments, is everyone, you know, 10 years older than you type of thing? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a little strange. So when I kind of first turned up to depot. Everybody else seemed a hell of a lot older. Um, so there was one other guy called, um, well, I won't name him, but he he was another guy who'd pretty much been told it's either kind of a kid's prison or you join the army. <laughs> so he uh, he joined the army. He ended up in uh, in our first battalion um, and had a, a fairly decent career. Um, yeah, it was most of the kids got broken, so pretty much everybody um, got kind of injured in in some way or another. But what was it? Uh, what do you think made you a little different where you didn't get broken? Yeah, it was it was just one of those. I, I don't know whether it was mindset, luck, flip of the coin, or or what it was, but. Yeah, I, I managed to kind of squeeze through one of the slightly larger holes in the net and uh, <laughs> ended up in uh, in two para. But and uh, how, yeah. how long did you spend in two para? Um, Fourteen years I spent in two para. Yeah. So yeah, most of those I think eleven of those were in the battalion sniper sniper platoon. So 
Yeah. And then uh, what led you to make the decision to uh, try your hand at something a little bit more high speed? So um, selection was one of those kind of things. Um, always wanted to, to kind of give a try. Um, eventually kind of squeezed through one of the even bigger holes in, in that net and uh, <laughs> get, get to, uh, get to uh, that unit. But it was just one of those kind of things. It was the highest kind of form of soldiering, um, and that was all I really wanted to do. Not, not giving yourself much credit there, just squeezing through big holes, yeah. barely one after another. <laughs> the hardest big hole in probably the entire world's uh, military yeah. just happened to make it through. And then, uh, so how long did you spend in that unit? Kind of uh, what, were your, what were your roles there? Or, you know, even, even the, the process of selection, what, you don't have to say numbers, but percentage-wise, what would you say, you know, so, percentage of people making it through? I think we started with, I can't remember, maybe a couple of hundred guys, and that gets slimmed down to, uh, well, we, I think I passed with 10 again. Um, so 10 guys kind of got through that, um, which works out as, I'm not sure what percentage, but it's a low, low percent, which is kind of average. So they've ran selections where no one has passed. They've ran selections where more people have passed. It, it kind of goes up and down over the years. But. And then did you get to, you, you came from a sniper at two para, right? Yeah. Is that something that carried over? Did you have a choice or did you just say, hey, this is what you're doing for um, your role? No, it was one of those things that I really enjoyed doing. Um, I like the smell of wet hessian, but that's just <laughs> one of those, uh, one of those kind of things. So the head sniper in my unit took me on the range, saw how I could shoot and was like, okay, yeah, you've, you've kind of got a job. So that was it. And then, uh, you were also, you're a patrol medic as well. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, we you could be instructor. So how, how do you end up uh, as a patrol medic, uh, in so addition to what you were doing? It, it was everybody that goes in the unit, you either go one way or the other way. So you either take demolitions or med. And I was lucky enough to kind of get uh, med. So yeah, that was something that I uh, kind of fell over backwards into, really enjoyed. Um, yeah, it was, uh, that was all right. Yeah, you still got both ass cheeks and the gums for you. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> and then uh, how, how long did you spend there? Um, uh, so I think all up in regular service, I spent 10 years um, with, the, uh, with the unit and another I think three after that in uh, in reserve service, but yeah, it was uh, it was a good time. What what, what was uh, what would you say is like a a moment where you're like, oh fuck, this is a little bit different than two pair. Did, did you have that that singular moment? Um, probably on the first kind of exercise that we went on. So going on my first uh, exercise jumped in with my unit, hit the ground, was then kind of about to get up, pack my chute, get my gear, you know, get my rifle and everything. And the squadron sergeant major and the OC actually did that for me. And I was kind of like, okay, that's a bit different from, uh, from two para. But I think the thing to remember with, with that unit is nobody feels above kind of picking up, um, picking up a shovel, picking up a broom, or just doing what needs to be done. Yeah, I, th I think that was reflected when, you know, we would, we would do our missions together, where typically, you know, you, you were always the point man, no matter what we did, crossing the minefield, yeah. assaulting anything, and you're like, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be me. And everyone's like, all right, well, like, try, try not to fucking die while you're out there. You're not, not supposed to be like this, but, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of a, a real life reflection, you know, on, on that mentality. Um, all right, so from there, so you spent about what, 10, 10, 11 years there yeah. um, with that whole time. Um, now, is there anything, I don't know, any, anything there, um, you know, carrying over to Ukraine, uh, things like that, kind of the shift from what we talk about, you know, the, the 20 years of, of GWAT type of war and then shifting over to Ukraine. And you had mentioned in like Syria, you had seen, uh, you know, Russian drones, things like that, but... Yeah. What do, you, what do you think a little bit of a different one's between those so, two? So, 
It was uh, it was incredibly different. Uh, kind of getting out of the military. Um, I got out into the COVID disaster. Um, kind of ended up working in uh, Libya for a little while. Um, from Libya, I think I moved over to Zambia. Zambia, I went to Nigeria. Nigeria, I went to Qatar. Qatar, I went to Costa Rica. And then after that, I ended up in Ukraine. So Ukraine originally, the idea was just put some food on the table, pay the bills. Um, and that's, that's all it was. So I got a job um, with a company that looks after a lot of our kind of ex guys. And um, I managed to go and get a job uh, looking after news crews. Realised after not very long that I don't really get along with news crews, but yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was a long rocky road. But yeah, I know you had mentioned previously that there are some singular situations that really kind of set you off. I want to say you were you were, you were in Bucha or Erpine, one of the two, mm. uh, and kind of had a rough time there. Can you say kind of what uh, kind of really what turned you? I guess yeah, there was. How would you say? You kind of realise after kicking around with, uh, how would you say, some some of the uh, some of the uh, journalists, you realise that they honestly don't give a crap about the people or anything that you're looking at. To them, it's literally just money. Um, so doing that kind of day in day out, I was. It wore a little thin after a while. Wore this a is the type thin. of thing where they're kind of just making up stories to fit their narrative, right? Yeah, so they would decide on an average day or get told what the uh, narrative of that day was. Uh, they would go out, clip pictures, speak to people, sound bite everything, and pretty much make it fit whatever the narrative was they decided on last night, the week before. Um, they would make it kind of fit. So that was kind of something quite unpleasant. And then your role with them was just kind of security, making sure they're safe type of thing. Yeah, it was trying to make sure no journalists exploded when they shouldn't do. <laughs> okay. but, um, yeah. Do you have any close calls or was, it, was there anything really going on uh, in the spots that you, you guys had went? Yeah, I mean, we had a, we had a cruise missile kind of fly over our heads in, uh, in Zaporizhia. So that did kind of, I, I can remember the uh, the journalist looking at it and he was like, that was a low flying plane. I was like, no, <laughs> it wasn't. You can tell by the big explosion just down the street, but yeah. Yeah, I remember we had uh, we had spoke at that time. We were in the same area yeah. of you. We were probably, I don't know how far away, we were 800 meters away from each other, not knowing it. Yeah, And Nuts. I think we had four or five cruise missiles fairly close <laughs> yeah. to where we were at that time too, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, so you got fed up, fed up with the news guys. Yeah. And then uh, kind of where, where'd that take you afterwards? So afterwards, um, I had, how would you say, become aware of uh, a group um, run by an ex Marsoc guy um, that was uh, apparently training up Ukrainians that kind of needed it. And at the at the same right time, their dual role was to go and extract civilians out of uh, pretty bad situations. So anywhere that was looking at getting surrounded, cut off, or overrun, they would go in um, and get the uh, get the civilians out. So I ended up going to work for them. So yeah, that was kind of a, a bit of a dual role. So you would end up training. And uh, I ended up running their extraction team for a little while. Um, but was yeah. this was this the group you were doing extractions? No weapon. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. That was that's uh, a cool move. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's actually you get a badge for that. <laughs> doing war zone extractions with no weapon. Yeah, some of that was a little uh, a little rough. So one particular time uh, began with an M. The uh, how would you say the group's commander. Um, we, we were doing an extraction from another area completely, and he was like, 
I'm just going to drive down to the front line with these guys. And I was looking at the local, uh, where well, he was a, a vicar, and like an army vicar, if you like. So I was looking at this guy and the other guy, and uh, I was like, we can't do that alone. And um, I goes, I'll go with you. And he was like, no, 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 it's all right. I was like, no, 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 you're not doing that alone. I'll come with you. We jump in the car and it really stunk of marijuana. So I was like, can you smell weed? And he was like, yeah. I was like, all right, in for a penny then. <laughs> Let's do it. So we ended up driving. Suddenly all, all the trees start getting blown down and there's a load of mess all over the road. We're kind of weaving in and out of shell holes. It's like, this place has been pretty trashed. And the next thing we know, um, got a Ukrainian soldier pointing a rifle at us and jumps out in the, the middle of the road. And he's like, points to this, like a little bust up underground garage. We pull off the road, get dragged out of the car, you know, AK muzzle under the nostril. Um, and they, they were like, do you realize if you'd have driven a few extra hundred meters down that road, you would have hit the Russian army? We're the front line. And uh, I was like, shit, uh, pull, pull your phone out, Google yourself and just show them who you are with all your ribbons and tapes on your uniform. And he was like, I haven't got a signal. Um, so we had a bit of a moment there where eventually they managed to get uh, somebody that spoke English, eventually let us go. We kind of got a bit released. We drove around a corner and up another road and the same thing happened. We ended up getting dragged out of the car and it was even worse. Um, and in the end, they got their commander to come over. We told them who we were and we ended up having quite a decent relationship with that unit. But yeah, that was kind of exciting. What uh, timeline wise, when is that month here? Ooh, that would have been, let's have a look. Maybe May time last 2022. year. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like early war type of, yeah. type of things. Yeah, so that was kind of exciting. So we kind of drove back like that. Jesus, that was an experience. But yeah, did you have um, did you have a rape whistle on you or anything to defend no, against no, the Russian military? We, yeah, we, <laughs> we didn't have anything, but yeah, could have saved you. <laughs> uh, all right, so then in May, um, and then I think we met up with you June, end of June or early July, something like that. Yeah. Probably pretty shortly after. Yeah. I think we, uh, we had signed our paperwork together and then uh, kind of went on from there uh, with some of our favorite and least favorite people all in one. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I guess if, if you want to talk about <clears throat> um, maybe that little bit of time from kind of from the July to September, October time frame, and kind of what you were up to, I, I know, but for everyone else, you know, kind of what you were up to in that, in that time. Yeah. And a little bit of a difference from what you were doing before. So, yeah, I kind of got sold the Legion on uh, kind of some false promises. Um, so I was told that the unit I was going for, ah, oh, they do, this, that, and the other. They run human teams. They're blowing up trains um, in the forests and everything, working way behind the lines. And I was like, sweet, that sounds like a BME. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go for that. When I turned up, um, I kind of realized that I'd been sold uh, a bit of a donkey. Turned up, and it was literally the, uh, the guy that had sold me that donkey literally kind of brushed his hands and was like, over to you, it's your game. And I was kind of like, holy shit. Um, so I kind of wore that for a little while, um, tried to kind of get a few jobs going. Um, yeah, me and Ned kind of, Ned was uh, one of the other TLs in that group. We got called into, uh, help with the planning of another big mission. Um, and while we were down there, we, we kind of got asked, uh, do you want to go fighting? And um, it was like, yeah, yeah, we do. 
he was like, right, okay, get yourself to here. Um, so we drove all the way, eating jelly babies and monster. Um, the usual diet for you? <laughs> kind of got down there and I got told, okay, you're leading um, black team as it was. So I was like, okay, right. Um, and that kind of kicked off um, probably a little bit of an epic. So the job, how it was explained to us was uh, some guys were going to swim down a river um, a good couple of kilometres, get to a pre-planned kind of landing point, um, recce or recon it for mines and Russians, uh, make sure it was all kind of safe. Um, and then kind of give us the call over the radios. We were going to come in um, as 26 men, it was. 26 men um, were gonna land all quietly, all on, uh, all on night vision, sneak into the bottom part of a village, try and clear it uh, very quietly and gain a foothold. When we gained that foothold, we were going to send on the radios um, and that was going to kick off engineers blowing a bank down to make it um, flatter so armour could kind of pull up it. Armour was then going to drive across the uh, quite shallow river, swing a left turn and uh, move in um, and support us. We also had some engineers that were going to clear through the mines that were just behind us. Um, and all of that was going to be with quite heavy um, artillery support, tanks, um, a BMP to get the wounded out. Um, to say it didn't work out that way would be an understatement. <laughs> so we turned up there and I was expecting to see, you know, tons of tanks, armour, artillery and everything. And we got there and there was nobody, just some inflatable boats. So we were like, just got absolutely pummeled with uh, quite accurate drone controlled mortars and artillery at the actual embarkation point um, for this landing. The lads had already swum down the river um, to recce that. One of the boats got damaged. We all took cover in some buildings. Um, we sent teams down. Um, it caused quite a significant delay. We were supposed to land in pure darkness. It ended up pushing into daylight um, and we landed. And as my team was headed down the river, we got, I don't know, 100 odd yards away from the uh, kind of D-bus point, the, uh, the beach landing, if you will. Um, and it sounded like the entire universe opened up so loads of small arms fire, loads of explosions. I was like that to the boat driver, get down there now. So he puts a kind of spurt on. We pull up, you see the lead medic for those 26 men shot through the thigh, self tourniquet on the beach. So he didn't quite make it anywhere. Um, he literally jumped off a boat and got dropped. Um, Two, two rockets get fired. I crawl up. I'm like, what is happening? And uh, it was uh, an ex-SFSG lad was like, Charlie team's gone long. I'm like, okay, right. Everyone get on my back, follow me. Kind of charged after Charlie team, tried to catch them, couldn't. They kind of did a little chicane through a load of buildings and ran smack into a PKM at point blank range. Took another couple of wounded. Um, we'd left two guys on the riverbank for the apparent reinforcements. Um, so we were now down to 10 guys. We kind of hooked in. Uh, the team commander of the team that had ran into the PKM, and it was literally nose to nose. So I'm talking five yards or less. Uh, full frontal arc, um, PKM, rifles, the whole lot. He tries telling me where to put guys, and I'm like, mate, go away. You just 
got your guys chewed up. Like, I'll decide which way we're going. So, tried to kind of push round on a left hook. A couple of Kiwis nearly got dropped. Pulled them back out of the way, tried a right hook, same. So, I was like, right, okay. I think all up, I threw maybe seven grenades, something like that. Um, other guys threw another couple. We tried everything. So, we tried... 40 millimeter grenade, trying to get that through the wood at the top. Um, it just bounced back. We tried hitting it with an RPG. So we got the uh, the beach landing kind of team to back up to the minimum safe distance with an RPG. They smacked a uh, an RPG into it. So the whole place was smoking. When I say throw grenades, it was literally kind of posting them right on top of the enemy um i ended up in a bit of a what would you say a duel with a with a pkm gunner so he was probably about five yards away and in between us was uh, an asbestos gate and i watched his group size right in front of me grow from one round to probably about that big um i held my ground end up hitting him in the pelvis uh, he dropped, I was then like, right, okay, I think it was Charlie team had a linguist in it, so I was like, right, you know, give it a go. Um, he was like, look, you're surrounded by special forces, you're going to be killed if you don't give up, you know, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> and he was told to fuck off um, with a massive burst of PKM. Um, that got kind of weird. So we tried a few different things and I was like, I'm out of options. Has anyone got anything weird that we haven't used? Somebody just puts a thermite grenade in front of me. So thermite is one of those kind of weird things. Um, I think you and the Russians kind of use it for equipment destroying. And... I get this kind of Coke can thing put in my hand and I was like, ah, oh, fuck it, here we go then. Pulled the pin, shout thermite out, throw it over, big flare up, load of smoke. And I was like, linguist, give it another go. So he tries the same thing. And uh, the lads that were in the building got their youngest unwounded man and threw him out of the door. So in he comes, like, had to... Um, Stop some unseemly things happening to him, grabbed him, sat him on the floor, and he was really shaking. And I mean, literally, you know, like he had a road drill in his hands. And I was like, right, zip tie him, um, tell him he's done well, but it's game over. I go, throw him back in there and tell him to get everybody to come out. So we zip tied him, threw him back in, and it wasn't that long after, so probably, I don't know, five or six seconds after we threw him in, it was, uh, he came out, then the next guy, then the next guy, the next guy, the next guy. I think all up, it was nine men we, uh, we captured out of that house. So they were all fragged up, all marked up um, with grenade frag. Um, and I think, to be honest, it was the thermite that actually just broke their will. It kind of freaked them out a little um, and was a little weird. So that happened. The, uh, the guy that I'd shot through the pelvis, he was laid on the floor next to an unexploded impact grenade. Um, so the way they work is they work on a three to four second fuse or it's got a little ball bearing in it. So if you took one, pulled the pin and dropped it in a swimming pool, the change in kind of gravity would make that ball kind of roll um, and initiate the, uh, the explosive. So there was an unexploded one of those literally laid right next to this wounded guy. So I goes to the commander of Charlie team, we need to get him up and out of here. And he was like, why? And I'm like, that's fucking why. He's like, yep, okay. So we scooped him up carried him back to the medic 
and he uh, he checked out not long after that. So that kind of kicked off a big chain of events. My team was now lead assault. Um, we needed to left hook um, around the building that we'd just taken and hit the next kind of compound, if you will. Um, it was one of those where I think it was Ned was like, front gates are, are out, we can't use them, they'll be wired to blow. I was like, yeah, agreed. Um, so I was like, go get the sledgehammer out of that building. So we ended up with a sledgehammer. I got past that. I took the 66 off my back, extended that, gave it to uh, one of the other boys, grabbed a PKM gunner off the other team. And I was like, right, on go. I'm gonna sledge straight through that wall. You're gonna get up fire your 66 into that building um, and you're going to pop up and put a round through every empty kind of area of, uh, of that building, all right? So one, two, three, go. Everything kind of kicks off. I go through the wall, I think with three good whacks, give a good breach, get the lads through. We clear that compound, we clear the next compound, the next one. And uh, yeah, it got kind of, it got kind of bad. We spent the whole rest of the day. We got, it was soon after that, we ended up getting uh, mortars and artillery kind of plastered on us and that didn't let up for the whole rest of the day. So pretty much if you got a Jane's manual of every Rus Russian weapon system, we pretty much went cover to cover. Um, and it was, it was kind of weird. So most of the time that we weren't attacking, we would hide away either inside buildings or get down in the basements. And uh, it was much, much later on in the day, we were all really hungry, calling for reinforcements, um, no comms, radios failed. It was uh, a little bit of a mess and there was an explosion slightly outside followed by a load of swearing there was another explosion right by my sentry that kind of we we were down in a basement and it picked the sentry up and threw him down the stairs so i kind of grab him and i was like are you hit and he just shouts my legs um <laughs> in that time Two guys had started to go up the stairs, and that was uh, Mickey and Ned. And there was another explosion, literally probably about that far off the back of uh, Ned's head, um, right in between them. So Mickey was two steps up, um, Ned was two steps low, and it kind of went off in between them. It blew Ned straight into me. I went, are you hit? And he just made a, ah uh, noise so i was like and how do you know what i mean mickey took a bit of frag in the arm ned took a little bit in the back of his head um i can remember josh going what the f, f was that and i was like i think that was a ugl um and he's like that's not good i goes we can't stay here so i kicked all the crap out of the way part of the uh, ceiling had kind of stoved in on us as well kicked all of that crap out of the way, led the guys up the steps, counted them out and threw them into the building opposite. Um, the lads that were already in that building were like, mate, we've just been hitting here. So I was like, fucking hell, great. I think by that stage, I had torn my bicep on my, yeah, on that arm. So I couldn't actually hold my rifle <laughs> properly. So uh, I'm like, right, grabbed Ned. I was like, Ned, do you remember the first basement we were in this morning? He was like, yeah. I goes, right, lead them there now. I can give me a last man call. So count everybody out. Um, I couldn't get all the way up or all the way down. So it was one of them where at the time we were under fire from a couple of T-72s from across the water. Uh, they were kind of pummeling us. And things got pretty 
pretty kind of rough. We made it all the way back to that uh, basement. We all kind of go inside. And to be honest, by that stage, we'd been fighting long and hard. You know, it was one of them where ammo was looking a little shaky, grenades were looking a little shaky. Um, and it was one of them moments where you're like, right, suck it up. A couple of the lads start uh, kind of piling in a bit and uh, one of them starts hyperventilating. So I grab him, sit him next to you. I'm like, it's all right, no worries. Um, you know, it's been a bad day. You, you'll get over it sort of thing. And he's like, thanks, thank you. Um, after, soon after that, I had to stop the sentry from mowing down a lone Ukrainian with no rifle uh, running towards us. So I was like, right, come in here, come in here. So grab him and he's like, start spilling Ukrainian at us. And I'm like, mate, I don't understand. So he does this hand motion like that and makes like a boat engine noise. I was like, a boat, have you come in a boat? And he's like, yes. <laughs> so um, I'm like, right, come with us. We take him, have a little kind of conflab and uh, get to that stage where like black team had to get off the X. So we all pile into a boat, which was dangerously overloaded, um, but we managed. We all squashed in there. It was dark by now. Um, so we'd been fighting all day um, and we start kind of heading back. Still under, you know, there's mortars and artillery um, we were completely surrounded at the time. We had a minefield at our back and uh, the only other option was to swim. And in black team at the time, there were two guys that could not swim. And I'm like, and uh, well, three, if you included me, because I had a fucked arm. So I'm like, right, everyone in the boat, stay quiet. And then one of the Kiwis looks up and he's like, is that a drone? And I think somebody else goes, yeah, I think it is. Uh, soon after that, the entire universe kind of implodes on us and we're getting rounds landing, well, pretty much every direction all around us. Uh, all I remember is one of the lads that couldn't swim just looks at me and goes, please don't let me go in the water. I was like that. Yeah, and I'm thinking, no, 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 so everything's all right. And I'm thinking, please don't let me go in the water because I'm effed as well. But we get back probably about 25 yards away from uh, the embarkation point, which was where we were headed. Uh, the engine jacks, so just dies. A uh, couple of lads kind of pop over and swim us in. We're under fire again mortars and artillery, so get, a, get the lads up, get them in a basement. Um, you can see and hear enemy drones. Some of them actually smack into trees and crash on the ground. It got quite bad. So, you know, we told uh, some of the boys like, right, go, get, get out, um, get back to the, to the kind of safe house, um, which they did. We must have been there probably about 40 odd minutes. Can't hear any boats, can't see anyone, like waiting. Let's go down and have a look. So we walked down to the, uh, to the river bank and uh, the next thing I know, <laughs> one of the boys has got the, uh, the boat driver by the scruff of the neck, pulls him out of the bush and goes, what the fuck are you doing here? Um, the guy starts babbling in Ukrainian. So the guy just points a rifle in his chest and he's like you go back down there he goes if you come back with an empty boat i will shoot you so the guy's like yep in his boat he jumps he goes off down the river we never see him again i don't know where he ended up whether he sunk whether he was hit by mortars and artillery or if he's still with us but um we sit we wait for ages um, we eventually kind of get to that stage where we're like, we, we got nothing left. Like, you know, don't know where anyone is. So we pull back and we pull all the way back to the safe house. 
and uh, yeah, had to kind of stop two of the boys doing something unseemly to uh, to the guy that was commanding the uh, operation, who I think we woke up. Um, he was getting his head down at that stage. Um, we're like, right, fuck you, and we're we're going. So we jump back in the vehicle, drive back towards the embarkation point, and find um, the majority of I, th I can't remember Alpha team um, absolutely piss wrapped. They'd swum back um, and said the other team was kind of swimming back as well. So yeah, I think it was by the next morning everybody was back in the safe house, um, which, yeah, that was a little exciting. So that was uh, one of mine and Ned's little issues that we had. But was was that commander, was he on the assault with you or he stayed back the entire time? No, no, he, uh, he stayed well, well back. Um, apparently still a commander now. I've got no time for the guy, to be honest. A West, Westerner that. or a local? No, he was a, he was a local. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you guys have mortars, artillery, anything like that you could call in? Or is that exhausted? Uh... No, we had absolutely nothing. The only help that came across was four Ukrainian engineers pitched up partway through the day um, to uh, help us. And uh, that was that was it. That was the only support we had. So he kept, so that commander kept just saying, push, push, keep pushing, keep pushing. And uh, yeah, we kind of got the feeling that he didn't really uh, give a shit. But. Yeah, that seemed to be a, kind of a recurring theme, actually, when the commander wasn't with his guys leading the troops. It was always, you call him up, and it's always, yeah, we want you to keep going. This is yeah. honestly probably universal. Yeah. I would say, uh, when, when they're not there with you, so. Yeah. So you guys, you had the 7-8 uh, that you had captured. Yeah. Th those guys get handed off. Uh, did they get just thrown in a river? What, what, what do they do usually no, they, in, that, um, in that case? So after kind of talking some of the boys out from doing uh, some pretty rough things, um, they actually got put in a boat and sent back, so... Yeah, they actually, it, it kind of worked out in uh, the commander that wasn't there in kind of in his favor. Um, so it, it kind of looked pretty good on him. In all fairness, I think the entire operation was a bit of a, a false one. I don't think that we had half the support, half of anything. Um, I think it was just his idea. Um, but yeah, no, that wouldn't be the, the first or last one of those for us. No, we did no. the entire, uh, by rack assault exactly like that. Yeah. On two hour notice, I believe too. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So from there, what, I mean, timeline wise, that was probably August or something like that. I would say. Yeah. yeah Cause I remember, mm -hmm. uh, I think I saw you the day after we went to the gym. That's you right. said, oh, uh, I'm going to go bench, and you're benching whatever, 400 pounds, and you just look at your arm, and it's just all <laughs> bruised up. I uh, tried to climb out of a window or climb in a window or whatever the fuck you did. So Yeah, I ended up doing a uh, speed pull-up on one hand, so I was stood on what I thought was solid asbestos, and it just gave way, so I ended up doing a pretty much a speed pull up with all my kit on. Nice, but, so I'm sure that asbestos will get you here in the next 10, 20 years with cancer, <laughs> yeah. so good for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what gets you, not the war. <laughs> not the 14 deployments, 15 deployments, just yeah. asbestos. Yeah, all right, so uh, yeah, from that point, um, let's see, I mean, that'll take us probably right up, I mean, we actually did a lot of stuff. You guys formed great team around that time. Uh, shortly yeah. after, yeah, yeah, that was direct action team. You guys did, um, yeah, from, and and then from there, I mean, we we can go straight into getting your fucking brains blown out if you want to. So, yeah, um, kind of, kind of similar setup. You know what what was supposed to happen, what actually happened, 
kind of uh, the aftermath of that as well. So kind of if you want to talk about what was supposed to happen, yeah. you know, uh, on this. So we, uh, we got called from another job, um, called kind of forward, had no idea what was happening, kind of got there. And uh, then we realized, actually, look, there are nine Ukrainians. They are stuck in a basement. The uh, four story kind of building um, that was above them, so one underground, three above ground, was full of Russians, um, and they wanted them out. So we got kind of the call. Um, a couple of Legion teams had already tried. So the two kind of previous nights, um, a couple of Legion teams had kind of attempted, um, come under fire, took casualties, um, not even got to the target building. Um, so we kind of got the call. Uh, I think all up there were 40 guys and this was on the outskirts of a much bigger urban area. Um, the Russians were in full assault and this place had been overrun and there were nine Ukrainian survivors stuck in this basement. Um, they wanted them back, so it must have been somebody's son or heir. Um, and they were willing to sacrifice 40 guys. And they were like, you all right leading this? And I was like, well, I don't know where it is, but okay, I'll lead the assault bit. Um, so they were, they were kind of happy with that. Um, I spoke to a couple of the, the TLs that had kind of attempted before just said, which way did you go? What actually happened? And uh, they said they had tried to move twice down a uh, strip woods that led to uh, a row of buildings. Um, the strip woods was on the edge of a rail track um, and it was surrounded by kind of open fields, a bit of rail infrastructure um, and these, these kind of strip woods. And uh, the team the night before um, ours. Uh, one of their guys stepped on a mine, came under fire, uh, they took casualties um, and extracted in a, in a bit of a shit show. So I kind of mulled all this over and I'm like, right, some of our guys don't have night vision. Um, so the strip woods is kind of out. You don't know what kind of mines or Russian positions are kind of in that strip woods. So that rules that out. Um, also, darkness is out because some of our guys didn't have nods. Um, so that kind of left us with a limited approach. Um, my view on it was we could make best time and someone was unlikely to have booby trapped the, um, the rail line. So I was like, OK. Let's arrange for um, a massive distraction, high miles long, um, mortars and artillery, or sorry, artillery in a little bit closer, and then mortars literally right on our nose. So I arranged a, a bit of a kind of scattergun um, effect uh, for that. And the idea being just get everybody's heads down. We were going to get to a friendly checkpoint just short of the... Uh, the position with the nine Ukrainians in there. We were going to get to that friendly checkpoint, wait for the distraction, um, cut down this rail track um, at first light, get to, the, uh, get to the building with the Ukrainians in it, hit it with every rocket and missile that we could, forge forward, uh, punch in, clear to the basement, get the lads out, and throw them back down the line. To say it didn't go that way um, is probably a bit of an understatement. So I was, all the distraction, everything went perfect. We had an old Ukrainian sentry um, that had actually uh, done sentry duty in that building, knew exactly which one it was. His job was to get us to uh, gap in the fence and literally give us that. Um, I was just fanning the guys out, so just kind of putting people in position when a uh, Russian come running out of the building, probably 20 yards in front of us. Um, and he came out with a red flare in his hands, hit the red flare, 
looking back, I think that was probably a warning that enemy is either right there um, or, you know, in that vicinity. We engaged him, so eight or nine guys opened fire on him, including a GPMG gunner. Um, you could see dust kind of popping off his uniform. Uh, he turned around and actually made it back into the building. Probably died very soon after. We immediately came under fire from a number of different sort of positions. Won that kind of firefight. Everything was still kind of uh, cooking off. I gave a standby for rapid, rapid fire. I then moved alone uh, to go and recce the, uh, the breach point. So reached the target building. You could see the walls were very broken. Uh, you could see through some of them. Um, so I kind of raised my rifle, have a quick peep around the corner and came pretty much nose to nose with a Russian. Took care of him, uh, put him down, stepped back out of the way. A 66 kind of came through that doorway. Um, everybody kind of fired loads of... Uh, missiles, load of small arms. I gave a uh, need three call, got three guys. I goes, right, we're going in there. Um, you know, the, uh, the doorway. By that stage, part of the floor above had fallen into the doorway and it was gonna take us a good eight or nine seconds to, to kind of get over that. So I began to pie and just as I kind of stepped around the corner, uh, there was another Russian stood right where his mate had just died um, with his weapon raised. He splintered all the door frame. I put him down, was still under fire from further back in the uh, building, stepped back out of the way. Um, there was then a shout of grenade. So we then started getting pummeled with grenades at the top floor. Um, and that's kind of how that assault ended pretty much grenade after grenade after grenade. Um, couldn't get more than a couple of syllables back. So pulled back 20 meters to the fire support position. Um, kind of <laughs> undid, our, undid our knot in our knickers. Um, got back on it, went again, tried to assault. Same thing happens. By that time, one of the other teams had took the building next door so we pulled back to that building and I don't know whether we must have hit that target building 14 or 15 times. We were getting real low on ammo. Uh, we tried everything. I threw grenades through that doorway. I even threw a homemade TNT charge through it. Um, it had been hit with pretty much every rocket and missile, either the NATO or the, the Russians have kind of built um, and they were still kind of swinging so 14 or 15 times kind of later uh, one of the uh, ex SFSG guys was like how many times are we going to hit this thing and I was like yeah good point so grabbed a Ukrainian major um, and a Ukrainian captain you know how many times do you want us to hit this thing? Uh, the Major was kind of up for sticking a, a pin in it right then and kind of heading back. The Captain pretty much dropped his fill at that point and he was like, that is our men in there. Fucking go and get them. That kind of tugs on the old heartstrings a bit. So I'm like, right. Um, most of our guys were now either fragged up from all the grenades getting thrown out of the top stairs. Um, so I was like, right, anyone still standing, get on my ass, we'll give it another try. We go back. Um, I think that's when Ned took a round through the shoulder. Um, yeah, he was, he was in a pretty bad way. He actually jumped on top of me when one of the grenades was thrown, which I told him off for. Um, but it was, it, it got kind of bad. So we pulled back. Uh, we then get the, the call, man down. So I'm like, fuck. Look, looking at the state of everybody, I was like, if somebody is man down now, they're going to be properly hurt. 
So I start running back down the uh, row of guys, um, get to Joe, who also didn't make the end of the day. Um, get to Joe, I was like, Joe, who's, who's the man down? And he's like, I have no idea, buddy. Um, at that moment, everybody comes spilling out of the house. Um, I'm like, right, what's happening? Grab um, the excess of SG lad, and I'm like, what's, what's happening? He was like, lads are done, everybody's pulling out. So I'm like, okay, right, you lead them back to the friendly checkpoint, um, give me a last man call. Uh, Ned refused to leave, so he was pretty chewed up. Um, he had grenade frag in his back and was shot through one shoulder. He refused to go, so me and him kind of left last. Um, we start moving back um, the same way that we came in, straight down the rail tracks. Uh, by this stage, you know, the Russians had drones all over us. You couldn't hiccup or blink without being pummeled by God knows what. We were getting shot at by... Um, from odd directions, we were getting shot at by tanks. Um, there was there was kind of a lot going on. We start moving back down this rail track, and uh, the Ukrainian major and his captain start arguing over a radio. So I'm like down on one knee. Um, in the end, I had to ask Ned. I was like, Ned, what are they doing? So Ned walks up. What's happening? Blah blah blah. Has a, has a quick chat with him, turns around, looks me right in the eyes, and he goes, they still got guys back there. I was like, oh, you're joking. Okay, uh, we look at each other, and I'm like, we gotta go back. So, I thought it was four guys, it ended up being five. Uh, turn back and head back into the Russian onslaught, if you would. I think we got probably about 300 meters into that journey and um, two guys came blundering through the, uh, through the strip woods. We grabbed them over. One of them was really bleeding, wasn't holding a weapon, uh, was really bleeding out of his uh, arm. So grabbed him by the collar and I was like, are you good? And he was like, yes. I'm like, right, fucking go, get out. Um, so we get, get the kind of, get the wounded, sort of off off the uh, off the X, start moving back down the uh, rail track. Um, you can hear a lot of movement, sort of either side, uh, a lot of vehicles, a lot of mortars and artillery, all the way back down the train track. You could see the friendly checkpoint getting uh, explosion after explosion, sort of everything kind of launched on it. And I was like, holy shit, that's the, that's the safe place where we're going. We get right up to it. To explain, uh, the, ra the rail track was dead straight and it went on pretty much out of, out of eyesight. Um, so it was a dead straight uh, rail track. There was an overpass over it and I think the, uh, the Yukis had kind of blown both sides, dropped it onto the, uh, onto the rail track and then built a bunker in one side of it. Um, that was the, uh, that was the friendly checkpoint. We got up to that kind of bunker bit, um, and the Ukrainian major refused to kind of move any further forward. He just took a knee and wouldn't get up. And in the end, I was starting to get the hump uh, with this because my back was kind of open to, um, to the Russians. And I'm like, what is he doing? So Ned walks up to him has a quick spiel, and then I just see Ned raise his rifle, and he said, if you don't get up and walk over that berm, I will shoot you where you sit. So I was kind of like, the uh, Ukrainian major had a bit of a fit over that, gets up and pushes over. Um, when we get over the other side of the berm, I could see why he was so reluctant, uh, reluctant to kind of go. So the other side of the berm was pure carnage. Um, guys getting tourniqueted, you know, wounded, um, and it was a bit of a mess. You could hear in people's voices, everybody's voices had kind of gone up a couple of octaves, and you were like, I think the stress of the day is starting to get to lads, so I'll take kind of centre stage. 
we got in the middle, start kind of um, organising people and everything. And uh, that was when the first tank round blew me clean off my feet. Um, so yeah, T72, main armament round, 125 mil, bang. Blew me clean off my feet. Um, I kind of get back up, expecting to see sort of a, a bit of a mess. Realised, still got gun, still got helmet, still got both boots on um, and all four limbs and you've got a job to do. So kind of retook my place, re-controlled everything. Um, and then after that, there was a big kind of big explosion and that's when uh, Ned ended up losing his leg. So I was like, right, that's all the control onto me now. Um, run over to Ned. Um, he was in a, a bit of a mess. I was like, right, let's get him down the hill. So we pick him up, start kind of dragging him down the hill. Um, got, well, part of his, part of his leg had a bit of a bone stuck out of it. That actually got stuck on a tree branch. Um, we tried to kind of pull him off. We ended up having to pull him back and then go around it. Uh, got him in the back of the vehicle, um, pulled his head over, gave him a kiss, whispered something in his ear, said to the driver, right, get him out of here. Um, he never managed to get him out of here. It's, there was a load more artillery and mortars, a load more wounded, and I'm like, right, okay. Take centre stage again. Um, sort of try and control everything, try and lower everyone's uh, sort of stress level. Um, and that's when the second tank round pretty much landed right in between my legs. It blew the inside off both my legs um, and the back off my right one. Um, I, I remember looking down at the tattered mess that used to be my lower body and thinking, shit, you're in a bit of a bad way there. Um, I remember shouting over to Ned, pointing down, and he's like, yep, gave me the thumbs up. Um, That's after you got hit, you remember him just giving you a thumbs up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like we're both in the same game now. <laughs> but there, there it was. I don't really remember much after that. All I can remember is by lads that kind of survived, um, they said, uh, they were, they were kind of screaming at me to kind of get in a trench. So I think I got up, went to walk, uh, towards the trench, got to the lip of the trench and heard another round coming in, um, took a knee and the round actually landed in the trench, killed Cy, killed Joe, killed George, um, wounded uh, Bruce and yeah and that was uh, that was your lot it also knocked four square inches out of my uh, forehead and made me look dead so from all the accounts that were there uh, Brucey tried to drag me in the trench um, and just got told no he's dead fucking leave him he he severed an artery in his arm um, kind of got tourniqueted, dragged off. And I think because I was sort of held up, <laughs> I just uh, slumped in place. Kevlar managed to hold me up, um, but I had blood, brains and everything kind of streaming down my face and was completely uh, incoherent. So um, I think I was the last foreigner to, to leave that position. So eventually I think I made a noise or did something and someone realized, fuck, he's still in the game, threw me in the back of a, a truck, drove me to a field hospital where I believe they managed to save my legs. Um, one, two, yep, yeah, they did. Um, so they managed to save my legs, um, realized that they didn't have enough neuro kind of experience to sort my uh, my head out. So I got kind of bust further north. Um, yeah, kind of nuts though. 
kind of nuts. Four months in hospital that cost me, four months. But yeah, that was uh, that was my last. Yeah, that was the last time I kind of set foot on the Ukrainian soil. That so that was that. You remember? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, do you remember being in the hospital? Do you remember getting carted out, or they just you just drugged up and in the in a haze? What's the first thing you remember? Like coming, come waking up, I guess. So, um, my my wife actually came all the way forward to uh, Nipro and met me in the in the hospital in Nipro. Um, so I don't really remember much of that. I kind of remember possibly Kiev, um, because I went, you know, field hospital, then to Nipro, then up to Kiev, and then from Kiev I went um, elsewhere. But yeah, Kiev, I kind of have sort of hazy memories. Um, yeah. Then through pure, pure fear of your wife uh, beating you is what kept you alive, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. And do you remember? Um, you know, we, we've we've all like you know we've seen some of the pictures of your Kevlar after the fact. Uh, mm. You kind of mentioned it a little bit. Do you know? You know, like how much how much brain can a human man lose <laughs> and still be uh, functional as he is today? Yeah. You know, do you? Do you recall on so, what that might have been? Well, it was the four square inches of skull that actually got knocked out. They rebuilt with, I think it was a titanium plate. That put an infection in my skull uh, that it took four months of antibiotics to uh, get rid of. Um, they then replaced it, um, put me a new chunk of skull in. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of weird. So I can remember rough bits of the hospital. Um, I remember being stuck in London for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, yeah, it was kind of, kind of wild. But so you you were <clears throat> from the front lines, Dnipro, Kiev, and then what was what was the journey back home? I guess and recovery from Kiev from there. So I went back to a hospital somewhere else, um, stayed there for a few days, uh, got fed my first solid food in that place and promptly threw it up everywhere. Eventually got put on, a, put on an aircraft, um, flown back home to, uh, to a ward in, uh, in London. So yeah, kind of stayed in a in a ward in London, and then they eventually kind of packaged me back off home. But like like anything, uh, when you see doctors, they always give you crazy prognosis. You know, I'm sure with your brain, and they were talking about you know still possibly not even keeping your legs right. Yeah. You know, throughout this whole time. So what what were they telling you, or what were they telling your wife? Like you know, kind of outlook. So okay, so what's next? What's next? Um, and. She kind of asked that quite often, and the docs were all like, we don't know. There is no wound profile for somebody like this. He should have lost his legs. He should be dead. Um, so she was like, holy shit. Do you know what I mean? That was a, a kind of wake-up call for her. But, yeah, it was a, it was a, a weird experience, that. So yeah, so that experimental two pair program is still paying off to this <laughs> yeah. day that you can't talk about. Yeah. Yep. Kind of nuts though, but there you go. Yeah, and then uh, everything seems pretty decent now. You still have an open wound in your leg? Yeah, yeah. still got a little open wound. It's about the size of a quarter, just uh, on the inside of that thigh. But so I had that leg. I kind of get the feeling that however I knelt down, um, however it was, that was a through and through. So it's kind of blown the back off this thigh and the inside off there. Looking at it, I think that was a, a through and through piece of shrapnel. And then uh, this leg, there's a fair chunk of kind of leg missing from there. 
out of that one I actually lost my adductor so yeah that's gone but so T72s ain't shit is what you're saying yeah yeah okay. yeah kind of <laughs> yeah weird old day and the uh the lads in the basement um by all accounts I think it was maybe the night after or a couple of nights after they made a break for it I think uh, one of them was shot and recaptured. One of them did actually make it and, and escape properly. But yeah, kind of nuts. That kind of nuts. Uh, do, <clears throat> were you or Ned or anybody really able to get with those commanders afterwards to see kind of like what was the AAR, their, their after action, you know, what they thought of everything went down, why it went the way it did, or anything like that? No. So we were. Well, the both of us were in a bit of a drug, drug addled stupor um, for months afterwards. But yeah, kind of nuts. Do you know the weird thing is? Never felt any pain from my legs, never felt any pain from my head. So I was kind of pretty much out of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all the pain was left for Ned and his uh, open wound leg <laughs> stuck on a tree branch getting dragged. That's what he saved it for. Yeah. That's why he gave you the thumbs up. He knew. He's yeah. like, oh, yeah, this like, one's for you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, from there afterwards, like like we talked about before, you've just a shitload of experience, combat all, all over the place type of thing. What, I guess what what's the big difference for you? You know, like we talked before, this is just an extremely brutal war, you know, and people talked, they told that to me when I first showed up in Ukraine. You know, they said this is just not the same as this, which is which is very true. But, you know, like any grown man who thinks you're tough, you've seen everything, this, this, this and that. Right. Until you actually kind of see and feel that helpless feeling almost, I think, which is it was a first for me, you know, helpless feeling, because I also I was 21, 22 in Afghanistan. You go doing what you're doing. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm in the U.S. military. I literally can't be killed. We do everything better. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and then you go start fighting in Ukraine and pretty much what you said, there's days you run out of food. There's days you run out of water. They tell you there's tanks and artillery and mortars ready to go for you. You show up there. there there's nothing. It's just you and your boys, yeah. you know. So, But from someone with your experience, which is you know vastly more than mine and probably 99% of people who've experienced combat in their life, I, I guess some of the big takeaways are some of the, the differences between, I don't know, like I said, the, the brutality of... of you know, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, you know, even, even some of the other stuff that you've, that you've done that you don't mention versus, versus a war like this, I guess, and kind of some lessons learned for you and some things you might be able to, you know, tell your own military. Yeah, so Ukraine was, it was very different, probably not very different in uh, people's kind of attitudes to, towards each other. Um, there's always kind of hatred in, in wars, but this was the capability of, uh, of your average kind of enemy unit, which ranged from pretty much um, illiterate guys just kind of thrown into a uniform, shown the point at the end of an AK, and that was it, all the way to kind of tier one soft level, um, which was kind of nuts. Um, that kind of depended on where you were, what you were sent to do. Um, there were a number of different kind of factors involved in that. And it was literally, you know, on a night time, you could end up kind of facing people that would do certain things. Um, in the daytime, you would end up kind of facing people that didn't know how to dress, how to kind of equip themselves, wouldn't be wearing body armor or helmets. Um, and you were kind of like, there, there is a big kind of disparity here between different enemy units. But yeah, some of that was kind of a little, a little odd to deal with. But I think probably the, the biggest thing that took quite a steep learning curve was the amount of artillery air and everything else that kind of got piled on you so all i remember was at one stage the uh, ukrainians put in a six round cap on any mortar or artillery kind of mission yeah. so whatever you kind of had to hit 
you'd have to fight for that to get hit and they would fire six rounds at it and that was it bust six rounds was all you were getting and on an average day what you would get fired back um was wild so it would be two to three hundred rounds would would kind of come back the way um which took a little bit of getting used to um i think the other thing was armor as well like having enemy armor actually kind of chase after you um yeah there were quite a number of things obviously enemy armor fucking can sometimes get you but yeah it was it was kind of a, a little bit weird i think uh drones as well was something uh that kind of cropped up out there electronic warfare there was there were a lot of kind of things that were very different to what we'd sort of faced mm -hmm. um previous yeah i think things like this too you know like we had anti-armor teams, right, in, in, in our line units and things like that, but it wasn't anything we actually thought of, right, you know? Yeah. But when you hear anti-armor team now, it's like you, it's very vital. You know, don't fucking yeah. shoot your rockets at anything stupid, you know? Yeah. You know, be, be disciplined in what you're doing type of thing because it, it is a big difference. The difference between mm. your squad, I mean, really, a pl uh, I wouldn't say a full platoon. There's not many times we went out with 30-plus guys, to be honest, you know? Mm. You're probably 15 to 20, but still to, to be able to have that capability Make, makes a big difference or at least when you're shooting you know anti-armor you know it keeps them on their toes where they're like okay fuck let's yeah keep a little bit of a different di uh, distance type of thing um you know and same thing with the drones and of course our favorite parts is when you hear it overhead you don't know if it's friendly or enemy and you yeah. finally you know when, when you finally get comms you're like uh yeah we don't have any drones up we're like oh nice yeah. this is gonna be a good day for us <laughs> so yeah it was on the one of the jobs where we were on the water and uh, we got stoofed by uh, grad, multiple kind of grad strikes. Um, I got a couple of them on, uh, on film actually. And uh, it was only in the daylight, you kind of looked up and somebody goes, there's a drone up there. And uh, it was kind of, do we shoot, do we, do we not? And uh, the 50 cal gunner had a go at it um on our boat and uh in the end i was like da so i fired a mag everybody else fired a mag um people were reloading and firing at it and it turns out that was actually one of our drones so yeah <laughs> kind of nuts but yeah but i mean that's honestly that's that's the classic story because it's we're gonna lose a, a mavic too or something like that right you yeah. know they got those dime a dozen but also that's the communications issue too. You know, if yeah. they would just say, yeah, we got drones up, then then we know that makes our job a little bit easier. But yeah. I think uh, just it, n communication, not even on a small level, it's just, I, I think kind of like a battalion level asset where it's like, yep, we got drones, bop, 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 bop. But just the way, the way their military is set up, you know, they don't, they don't tell you shit. They don't yeah. tell you what they got. They don't tell you where it's at. They don't tell you where people are at. And that's why you end up with you know, unfortunately, a lot of fratricide and wars like this, that and people are super skittish, too, because, yeah, you know, you, you don't know. It's a little little different than, uh, you know, not as bad as Taliban fighting. They're wearing civilian clothes, but, you know, still it's you, you just don't know what's happening at almost any any moment, you know, yeah. just from communication. But, um, but yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think we'll wrap it up from there and then. Uh, yeah. That'll be it for us.